Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the third session of ICESA's Trade Credit Insurance Week 2022. I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, um, my name is Andre Dusing, as just introduced by Daniel. Um, I feel more than delighted to uh, moderate this session with so excellent panelists on, on this webinar. Um, I will do two things. I will introduce my, my colleagues in a couple of minutes and then uh, um, give you an overview about the agenda of this, this webinar. Um, yeah, looking on, on my colleagues, we have, as I said, four excellent uh, experts on the board, starting with John Cook. John Cook is consultant on trade policy with the City UK. The City UK is an industry-led body representing UK-based financial and related professional services. Uh, its members conduct a dialogue with the government on trade policy with particular reference to market opening in trade and services. Stefan van Bokstel is the general manager of Credendo. He's 25 years uh, in the credit insurance industry. Uh, after 13 years in the underwriting department of the ECA, he's now since 2010 in the private market business, specifically in the multi-risk multi, multi -risk business line, which includes not only uh, whole turn over short term, but also top up on excess of loss solutions. Um, as a third, he's also, which is quite relevant for our session today, he's a member of the board of director of the Russian Credendo in Ingostruck, which is of course quite challenging in these days. Then we have Johnny Caruthers, uh, he's director of BPL Global, seven years in the credit insurance industry as a broker, having worked for larger international broking houses and now in the last seven years with BPL, responsible and leading the portfolio credit insurance. And finally, put Peter Mulroy, he's the secretary general of FCI. FCA, FCI is the world's largest association and network of factoring and receivables financing companies. Uh, he assists banks, regulators, governance in educating the role in introducing the concept of factoring. Uh, himself, he's regarded as global ambassador for the open account receivables to supply chain finance industry. Yeah, we will um, do this session in, in, in the following way. The idea is uh, that we focus on, on the key items because the title of the session today is the changing the uh, changes in the nature of trade, which is a very broad topic. And we had some initial discussions how we can best serve the audience by providing insight in these changes. We have picked three key areas, which is the, one, the first one is the general trade developments up to date, but also to be expected for the future particularly changes around trade flows due to the economic changes, but also recently due to tensions and disruptions. That would be more or less the focus area of John. Uh, then in the second part, we um, explained a little bit that in these days, uh, trade, the nature of trade is more a financing one. So more and more trade is being financed based on the fact that it's done on open account. And uh, Peter will give us an insight here. Last but not least, Stefan and myself will also explain that trade and the nature of trade in these days is more and more becoming digital. And uh, we will explain the impact of that on our industry. For each of these three areas, we will do it in two steps. The first step is that we describe the development and the expectations for the future. And in the second step, in particular, Johnny and Stefan will explain a bit what does that mean what's the impact of this development in the respective area for our industry what are the actions the insurers have been taking or are taking at the moment yeah this is basically the agenda for the new session starting with the first one i'm looking now on john uh john can you provide us maybe inside what have been the long-term trends of trade so far well, thank you very much. Um, and may I say I'm delighted to be invited to join this panel and grateful to the organizers. Um, I see this session as, as very much a kind of pivotal session between the earlier sessions that have been on public perceptions of trade credit insurance and why financial institutions use it, and the week's remaining sessions, which will be devoted in more detail to specific challenges, technology, talent, and sustainability that face the market at, at the moment. Um, 
so and I, the second point, general point that I would like to make is that although this session is concerned with the changing nature of trade, I'm going to treat it primarily as uh, the changing nature of trade in goods, um, with also a reference to the role of services and the integration of services into goods by way of referring to services. But I feel that for many of our purposes, trade in goods is probably the, the key area. I'd like to begin with the long range picture, which of course is the picture we've all been used to over the last decades and which has been generally a favorable one uh, over the last half century. Um, the period since the Second World War saw a huge expansion of international trade, helped by a whole number of GATT, round general agreement on tariffs and trade, rounds of tariff negotiations, which succeeded in reducing average global tariffs from around 30 to 40 percent at the end of the war to around eight and a half percent when the WTO was established in 1994 and about two and a half percent now. So that's that has been a huge impetus to global trade. It's not, of course, the whole story. Um, fresh countries, notably China and the Asian tigers, have emerged into um, be, being big participants in global trade. There have been shipping developments, there's the WTO agreement on trade facilitation, there's new infrastructure in deep water ports. All of these factors have played a big role. And um, there are also bilateral and regional trade agreements, something we didn't really know of 20 years ago. Um, and in particular, now there is the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, which is a very much bigger agreement. I mean, closer to the lines of the European Union itself in its potential, um, with framework provisions for much deeper liberalization. So I think we have seen over the long term a whole number of very favorable um, implications for global trade. John, this sounds all very positive um, looking back, and I think you described it in, in a quite of uh, a very uh, rapidly increasing and improving uh, development. Um, so very positive, but recently we see also some issues and particularly how do you see considering these recent issues the future? Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right. There have been um, this favorable picture really has been very much disrupted over the last decade or so. First, we had the financial crisis in 2008. We've also had, um, we've, we've, we've also had other factors that have um, played a, a big role. There has been a big change in the factors contributing to competitiveness in global trade. And all these features, I think, have cast a shadow over the favorable picture that I that I painted earlier. Um, I think, uh, and of course, there have been other factors which have just changed trade, such as servicification of goods and the increasingly important role of services in how manufacture, manufacturers are able to compete in global markets in selling merchandise. But since really mid 2000, I think to in on the whole, the global trade picture survived the financial crisis remarkably well, all things considered. But since mid 2008, all that buoyancy has started to reverse. We've seen the big tariff wars that there have been between uh, the United States and China. Um, these resulted in, in trade diversion from market to market around the world and the growth of protectionism, partly as a result and partly simply because government policymakers are more cautious. There is also, and I think this is how these tariff wars have come about, there is the long run decline in American manufacturing competitiveness in global markets. I mean, that's 
uh, that's that's a really big factor, it seems to me. But it's not the it's not the only one. There's also been a general growth of non-tariff barriers um, and export restrictions. Um, for instance, Japan imposed restrictions on exports of certain raw materials to South Korea in 2019. And that was then. Since 2019 and 2020, of course, we have had the global pandemic, COVID, which has also increased um, export restrictions and disrupted markets, which were previously regarded as um, uh, pretty pretty solid and um, and constant. And I think all this has led to a growing sense of uncertainty and the metrics over uncertainty for trade and uh, economic policy rose in 2019. They rose quite sharply with suggestions really that many investors viewed a trade war as the top risk in the global outlook. And all this was even when all these risks were already occurring, the pandemic burst upon us in 2020 and it's been and just as we were recovering from that uh we have the russian invasion of ukraine in 2022 so we have a very much a disrupted scene to world to world trade what what were the main changes i'm going to leave the russian the russian invasion for a bit and focus more on the pandemic because i feel in the long run it's been the more important factor First of all, it's led to a huge disruption of global trade as trade flows were blocked by anti-COVID measures, quite apart from simply being blocked by planes being unable to land or ships being unable to discharge cargoes. So there was, but all that has also led to a fundamental reappraisal of security of sources of supply. That's not only goods relating to the pandemic from protective clothing to drugs but it's also led to an increasing reappraisal i think both among governments and among traders of what are secure sources of supply and that um, has led to reconfiguring uh, to avoid some of the what had been the, the cheapest but now emerge as the more risky sources of supply and a return to reshoring though i'm doubtful frankly myself just how much actual import substitution there will be with domestic production but certainly um friend shoring of looking to um looking to consolidate links with friendly sources of supply with lower risk what does all this mean well it means that the kind of factors that we had normally relied on in the past that comparative advantage would play a part and that um, traders would generally look to the most economic sources of supply that is now that is now changing and um, the source of supply will no longer necessarily be the source that is most competitive and all this in turn has led to and was leading already before the pandemic to big changes in trade volumes and how they flow along the major corridors. The Boston Consulting Group has done some interesting work in this area on the volume changes of trade flows. Um, they estimate that the trade flows between the United States and China, one of the broadest biggest bands if you look at a map of trade flows that that is set to fall by 2023 with compensating rises in south south trade and also some lesser declines in trade between the united states and other parts of the far east and between the eu and the far east there will be a rise in india's and africa's participation in global trade with both of those set to probably to be the biggest winners. As I've said, I'll leave Russia's invasion of Ukraine for later in this discussion. But I think one can say now that Russia looks likely to be a loser in terms of exports of fossil fuels, both because its weaponizing of its exports have revealed it to be a risky supplier. And of course, because 
the policies for net zero and sustainability will militate against um, a trade in fossil fuels over the long run. Well, to conclude, what does all this mean? It, it means that familiar patterns, volumes and flows all look set to alter. And also, I think, what is traded will itself change, not least through the growing role of services in global trade, whether through increasingly increasing trade in internationally tradable services or through the servicification factor that I've already referred to. So those, Andre, are the, are the, the big changes that I would like to summarize. Thank you very much. Thanks, John, for this uh, good first overview. And uh, we will talk in a bit again. Yeah, as I said in my introduction, we want to firstly describe and then secondly also assess a little bit the impact on the trade credit insurance industry. Stefan John has explicitly described the past and the future trade flow changes. Um, how do they, if they impact the business model of a credit insurer? So how are credit insurers reacting to them? And I'm pretty sure based on your long experience with Credendo, you can give us your clear insight. Okay, thank you, Andre. Well, first, let me express my gratitude for uh, having me in this panel. Uh, thank you for that, ICESA and colleagues for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Now, coming to the question, when I listened to John, um, all I can say is that as a credit insurer, we have to go with the flow. We undergo these evolutions and we have to adapt because we go where the client goes. We have to follow our customers and we always have to adapt whether it's going into the direction of globalization or deglobalization. Now, in terms of uh, or in times of globalization, just an example, a typical development of, let's say, a company from my home country, Belgium, would be to start up and start selling locally uh, on, on Belgian territory. And then after some time, decide to start exporting to neighboring countries, the Netherlands, Germany, France which is still pretty much the same as selling in your home country. There is no currency risk, no political risk. Then uh, a few years later, decision can be taken to, to start exporting to, let's say, the Czech Republic. Then you have a layer of currency risk. And then in the next step, one could start to export towards Russia, Ukraine. Um, and then it's a completely different ball game because on top of currency risk, you have political risk, which is clearly demonstrated by recent uh, events. Now, what does it mean for a credit insurer? Um, we follow that customer um, and it has actually two major impacts. Um, doing business in, 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 in the advanced world, in the mature markets, it's, it's, it has its challenges, but it's not extremely complicated. You need to have the knowledge, you have to develop the intelligence to do the business, to run the business, but it becomes completely different when you start doing these things in emerging markets. You have to collect the information, you have to develop knowledge and intelligence, so that's quite a challenge. Um, but we have to do it, otherwise we cannot support that customer on, on, on business in, in, in some more complicated, some more challenging markets. So that's the first um, layer of, of complication, I would say, um, impacting our business models. The second one is from a regulatory nature. As a credit insurer, you cannot just um, arrive in whatever country and say, we're going to start selling credit insurance policies here. You need to have a proper license in place. And in some countries uh, that can not turn out to be extremely complicated, um, expensive, um, and sometimes even impossible because there can be a layer of protectionism involved. So we have to um, work on these challenges and knowing very well that uh, if I say that we have to follow the customer, we are bound to do that. It might, in some countries, be excluded for us to do the business ourselves because we just cannot get the license. So then we have to turn um, to other solutions. And that can, for instance, be um, to team up with a partner, a local insurance company that has the license and is willing to share it with us, so-called fronting agreement. Now, whether it goes into the direction of uh, globalization and yeah, these days, um, as John described, nearshoring, friendshoring, more pointing towards the direction of less globalization we just have to adapt okay thanks stefan yeah i can concur on the latter one um i've been managing to open our russian uh, uh russian subsidiary or russian entity it is quite a burden to uh, get a license in some countries so i can also share the view from my experience uh, Johnny, um, 
what we have heard from John and also supported by Stefan makes clear that trade camps comes closer home. Um, what does that mean for the cover credit insurers have to provide? So the credit limits they have to issue because of this development. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think um, a consequence of this, you know, this nearshoring and reshoring of the supply chains that actually puts quite a lot of upward pressure, additional upward pressure on open account credit limits as this trade moves a bit closer to home. If you take into account the uh, the inflationary pressures that everybody's under at the moment, things like the energy price increases, um, credit insurers are going to be asked to take on high levels of risk um, in these in these areas. Um, you know, the recent supply chain chain disruptions have also challenged you know, the more traditional, you know, the just in time uh, models, um, meaning that once you uh, add this new or French shoring into the mix, it means that there's going to be increased requirements for stocks to be held. Um, there's a cost implication of that, of course, but also it again adds to that upwards pressure on what the credit limit requirements may well be and the requested limits that credit insurers are asked to consider. Um, this isn't new. I mean, the, the credit insurance market is already challenged uh, whenever there's a spike in things like the oil price, for example. You know, the same volumes are being traded, but the monetary value um, can increase and can increase quite quickly. Um, uh, so I think the future proofing of uh, the buyer risks from a risk underwriting perspective, the analysis that is done by credit insurers on how the buyers are geared up to um, survive in the in the uncertain future um, is going to be under increased scrutiny following COVID. You know, everyone's 2020 financials were were challenging because of the, uh, the, the slowdown in trade that happened there. Um, so I think these models are going to be tested even more over the coming months. So this future-proofing aspect, how will how will these risks be able to weather the coming storms? That's going to be really in focus, I think, for credit insurers as time goes on. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, yeah, now we we come to the second round with John. Um, I think you alluded already to the uh, current tensions and uh, disruptions. Um, if we would deep dive a little bit more on the long-term view with regard to these tensions, disruptions, how have they come about and, and uh, what are their key driving factors or what have been their key driving factors? Um, well, thank you. It's quite a difficult question and any answer is almost bound to be to some extent personal. Um, I would give quite a bit of prominence to um, the role of the United States. I mean, for a very long time, the United States was the dominant global player in trade. But now its economic power is steadily reducing as other competitors rise up. And I feel that this has resulted in, um, you know, an uncertainty among United States policymakers and a lack of confidence and a wish to reassert economic heft and that President Trump's tariffs, tariff measures have to be seen in that sort of light as part of a, a show of strength. Um, this isn't an unknown phenomenon. I mean, a hundred years ago when Britain was suffering the same sort of decline in the face of American competition. That was the moment when Joe Chamberlain spoke about tariff reform, which really meant an increasing degree of protectionism and reliance on imperial preference and commonwealth preference. Again, which is a kind of French oring, trading with your own markets, markets that you can control rather more. And I think we're seeing that kind of factor coming over um, world trade. The EU has been less assertive in that sort of way, um, but equally commission statements have been made have made clear that 90% um, of future global growth will take place outside the EU and EU policies must adapt accordingly. And more recently we have seen in the EU um, a wish for greater strategic autonomy and measures against uh, what, a, what is called coercion, which is, um, say, Chinese efforts to boycott exports from Lithuania because the Lithuanians um, 
said favorable things about the Dalai Lama. I mean, these are, um, so many countries are showing in different ways the need to take defensive measures of, of one sort or another. Uh, China is a growing power, but it's one of the features of its economy is that it, the, the metrics are not necessarily, and the trends are not necessarily transparent. And so in China, we have uh, current fears over unsustainable levels of Chinese domestic investment in the property market with uncertainty about whether there can be a soft landing for those sorts of factors. So I think there are there are many underlying tensions in um, global trade and uh, jostling for position. And alongside these, of course, there is there are all the pressures for sustainability and the approach to net zero in all its forms. And these again um, are creating uh, quite new pressures on, on, on trade policy. So I think all of these factors um, have played into um, the trends we, we identified in, in the last session. And of course, these are big factors that will go on playing into them. But these are, these are not just temporary phenomena, it seems to me. John, you have described this as a quite a long term view on things. What about the more immediate current political uh, disruptions? How do you well, see them? Indeed. I mean, one might have hoped that these long term tensions could have played themselves out in a relatively steady environment. But we that's, of course, not not happening. On the contrary, there have been two huge events. One is the pandemic with the consequences we've already looked at. And the other is Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has changed geopolitics and also added to global inflation by accelerating um, rises in global food costs and forcing a change of supply of uh, sources of, of fossil fuels. And of course, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine has also brought about unprecedented levels of sanctions against Russia. And these are sanctions which um, politicians may proclaim, but very often it actually falls to traders to implement them and to comply with them. And um, the need actually for traders to make clear to governments whether whether sanctions can be implemented and what the effects will be. So um, I think the results of both the pandemic and the Russian war have been a series of, of strains to supply chains and sudden shocks brought about by war and, and sanctions. And the impact is not just on traders, but on whole economies that are players in global trade, because those economies face sudden rises in fact in the costs of factors of production, which actually can threaten the viability of a nation's business model. And so I think the resultant instability and unpredictability has probably never been greater in recent decades. I can't think of a time uh, when it has. Um, so as well as the long term, we have those short term events, uh, which have really crystallized the problems and made it much more difficult to foresee um, how they will be resolved. Many thanks, John. It's great to have you on the panel and uh, I listen to you. I could do that for hours. Um, however, I think you have sketched out a quite negative outlook uh, on the supply chain, particularly due to current political disruptions. But uh, Stefan and Johnny, what does that mean for the credit insurance industry? So what have what has the industry done? How has the industry reacted, particularly, for example, to the Russian invasion in Ukraine? Have we learned, and I can say that also again from my experience, have we learned here from 2008 in particular of the financial crisis and the actions we have been taking there? Stefan? Well, um, yeah, thank you, Andre. Um, well, on Russia and Ukraine, I can only speak um, for Credendo, obviously, but from what I hear from my friends that I see and from large brokers, um, I think it's fair to assume that uh, the credit insurance industry more or less reacted in a similar manner. So in the week after the invasion, um, the decision was taken to go off cover on Russia, Belarus also, and Ukraine. 
on Russia, there was a distinction made, uh, not just by Credendo, but also by the industry between cross-border business and, um, and, and domestic business. And the cross-border was put in, um, in runoff immediately because of this uh, huge sanction threat that major Russian banks would be kicked off the, the SWIFT mechanism. So that happened. Um, now, um, that runoff is, um, I would say, going smoothly. Um, there have been some claim files opened but not that much as expected. Um, now, again, we have to make a distinction between Russia and, um, and Ukraine. Coming to Ukraine, right after the invasion, martial law was declared and payments were prohibited, uh, especially cross-border payments. But by now, um, it's, it's, it's amazing, but by now, um, for a lot of payments, an exemption was made. The permission was, uh, was, was obtained for importing companies to pay their suppliers. At first, that started with uh, pharmaceutical business and later on for more and more sectors. I'm not saying there's not going to be any claim whatsoever, but from my perspective, for the time being, nothing devastating. Now, that's Ukraine turning back to Russia. Um, this domestic trade that is still, albeit at a much lower level than before, kept in place it mostly has to do with pharmaceutical business, which is quite a stable sector. Um, must say also under each and every sanctions regime I've seen so far, there's always an exception for, <coughs> for pharmaceutical uh, products. Now, what will happen uh, going forward? Um, because the Russian economy will of course suffer a lot uh, from, from what is going on. Um, the very reason for the sanction is to to punish Russia, and that seems to, to, to work well. Um, we should not forget about um, very important stakeholders behind the credit insurance company uh, being the reinsurers. And the reinsurers, of course, also um, ask a lot of questions and they would like to wind down the exposure on Russia. And without reinsurance, as a credit insurer, you can't continue doing the business. So hand in hand with the reinsurers, uh, I think it's fair to say that we all took the decision to wind down um, our exposure. Even for the domestic one, there will be an issue, but it looks like in Russia that for the domestic business, a solution is um, on the way uh, in, the, in, in, in the sense that the Russian national reinsurance company seems willing to take over this exposure from the Western reinsurers. Now, for the time being, let's not forget that um, the Russian government decided that uh, domestic insurers in Russia cannot transfer money to Western reinsurers. You can ask for exemptions, but that's a very lengthy process. So um, have we learned something from uh, the 2008 financial crisis? I would say definitely yes. On the other hand, um, each crisis is different. Uh, I must say I'm in, um, in, in this business line since 2010, and it's one crisis after another. And each crisis is different. Um, we don't seem to do what we did wrong in 2008, that is uh, disappoint all of our customers by cutting limits overnight uh, drastically, because that's a huge threat for our own economies also, because supplier financing is then uh, in jeopardy. So that does not happen anymore. Uh, we do it more gradually in a, in a more sophisticated way. But yeah, as with globalization and deglobalization, these flows, um, whatever crisis comes up, we also have to adapt. Eh? We cannot just uh, continue doing business as if nothing happens. But we have to be careful with our industry that we don't get this um, blame game that um, we take away the umbrella when it starts to rain. So we have to be a little bit cautious. Now, this being said, um, customers did accept our position on Russia and Ukraine so far. Eh? Um, it's such a crisis. It's, it's yeah. of such an impact. And it's so obvious that uh, the clients, they, they, they do accept that uh, you put the exposure in runoff. Thanks, Stefan. It sounds like okay. that uh, although it was a challenge, as described by John, Credendo did quite well in, in, uh, in handling it. Um, Johnny, you have as a broker a much broader view on the industry, and uh, Stefan has already hinted on that a little bit. How do you see that for all the other credit insurers?
and the industry in, in as a whole. Can you confirm Stefan's view? Um, yeah, I think that um, yeah, the wider credit insurance market did react to, in a pretty similar way to Credendo. I think you know, there was that immediate suspension of cover for sales to Russian companies by the whole turnover market, you know, with some very limited exceptions. Um, wasn't really protested on the whole by policyholders. Again, I think everyone was in the same boat when it comes to accepting that the relationship and trading with Russia has to change. Um, and for those non cancelable access of hostile policies, then you know, the, the due diligence obligations really kicked in at that stage as well. So, uh, insureds were, you know, there would have been some conversations happening around um, what the exposures were like and what the ongoing trade was likely to be under um, uh, under those policies. But you know, generally speaking, then everyone would have you know, stopped, as, as, as we saw the global trade with Russia did, did more or less uh, halt overnight. Um, uh, there was then a second phase actually where um once once that had, had happened where the, the sort of the the non Russian businesses, but in places like you know, Cyprus and Switzerland where there was uh you know a Russian ownership link, um where there was maybe a little bit more investigation needed to happen around um you know, would they you know, navigating the you know the sanctions regulations that were ever changing as well, but really just making sure that um you know any trade that was still allowed was being done so above board and, and, and with everybody um, agreeing that it was uh, acceptable um, but with the same ultimately the same result on the whole you know, ultimately you know, that if it, anybody who seemed to be trying to um, uh, avoid the regulations wasn't going to get very far so it was all very broad and you know, very uh, uh, very you know, nice way I think everyone understood um, and right now then yeah I mean insurance on sales to Russia and Belarus is, is going to be basically a no-go um, uh, we have seen um, in some selected circumstances uh, trade with with you know, mainly Western Ukrainian businesses and uh, still happening which I think Stefan also alluded to that it's uh, you know, it, 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 it's not didn't get quite as bad for, for Ukraine in terms of the credit insurance industry as, as perhaps it could have done at this moment in time um, but still very limited um, and then I guess the question then becomes what happens to to those open balances that were in place before before the invasion um, some payments have been received some money has flowed out of, of Russia in particular in the meantime um, that's really dependent on, on the banks involved um, there are some quite serious backlogs within within the, the non-Russian banks um, uh, in getting payments approved you know, through their compliance departments obviously everyone's being very careful given the you know the sanctions regimes no one's fall foul of that and even where um, a Russian buyer is wanting to pay their overseas suppliers um, there are still obstacles in place, so this isn't necessarily about a, a willful default. This is about you know Russian Russian just wanting to to pay their debts as they can due, but not being able to due to the blockages in the banking system. Um, and it's not just as straightforward as you might uh, be able to swap swap banks to a to a more agreeable bank if it happens to be suffering. So um, you know there are some blockages in the system there for sure. Um, we're also approaching now. Um, the period where the kind of typical six months or so waiting periods are, are coming to an end. Um, uh, so what that means is that uh, clients will need to make a decision about whether they request identification for their insurers right now, or perhaps they wait a little longer if they're expecting that payment might be imminent. Uh, but those are those are the conversations that are happening kind of starting around now. Um, and it has been quite widely reported, I think, that. You know, the overall expected market losses towards the uh, the Russia Ukraine conflict um, will be acceptable for insurers in terms of uh, it's not going to significantly affect the the, the livelihood or results of any of the any of the major insurers. It's uh, you know, the, the numbers are still quite large. The exposure is still quite large, but I think um, never got to the pre two thousand and eight levels. So it's something where um, you know. It's not going to make a massive dent in the industry in that respect. Yeah. Um, there are, of course, also some some um, single risk policies. You know, with longer tenors where maturities still haven't happened yet. You know, some of these policies, you know, the maturities may not happen until you know, for two, three years, even longer from now. And um, so, of course, then there's a bit of a waiting game to see how things unfold in the meantime. Um, and finally, I think we've also seen this trend, and again, Stefan mentioned you know, what's happening at Credendo. You know, the, 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 the credit insurers, the multinational credit insurers, and the larger brokers have all um, taken some steps to, to shut down their operations in Russia, um, either by 
um, selling their you know, the, the ownership stakes to local businesses, or even handing handing the ownership of those operations to to local management, and that's something which I think is a result result of this conflict. That's something that, that has, has absolutely happened. Thank you so much, Johnny and Stefan, of course, as well. Um, I think we're grateful for this uh, insight in the operational risk management of the industry in case of shocks uh, like we have seen with the pandemic or the war. As I mentioned in my introduction, one element of nature of trade um, we have seen in this group the fact in the fact that trade becomes more and more a financed or a pre-financed one. And uh, for that, we have an expert with Peter uh, on board. Um, the, can you maybe explain to the audience a little bit more in detail how this major change can be explained and what it, does it mean on a more general term? Yeah, um, thank you, Andre, and um, thank you, Isisa, and of course my, my fellow uh, panelists. Uh, it's a joy to be here with you guys. Um, yeah, uh, of course, I think most people know, I mean, this trend has been going on for quite some time. Um, and it starts really with the concept of this evolution of assets. What's what's financed in trade? And, you know, uh, going back to the 1960s when the very first invoice was financed in, in, in Western Europe uh, in February 1960 in the UK, uh, these people, these companies were doing factoring, receivables finance, <laughs> without any laws, without any regulations. And this was a fact, um, and, and it's, a, it's the same fact today in countries, in the emerging countries, where they're just starting or they have been doing it, some form of invoice finance for some time. But you look at these asset, the asset classes, and this, you absolutely see this trend going from traditional assets that you can touch and feel to more intangible assets, financial assets, uh, assets like receivables that are becoming more and more popular, uh, and you can see that uh, as well. Absolutely, of course, in the volume. Um, you know, it goes from a, a scenario where where the you you have a lender and a borrower. You know, a, a two way street, so to speak. And now you have this world where uh, banks, uh, um, uh, sellers, and buyers are working together, uh, either you know, some form of receivables structure, uh, and uh, in this triangle. Uh, so where you're you're funding a, a seller. Of, uh, a company, but your source of repayment is a, a different company, uh, the, the buyer, the customer, or the seller. Um, yeah, it, 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 we take it for granted in the West, but in many countries in the emerging markets, this is completely new. And so it's it's still evolving. It's still, uh, and that's where we spend so much of our, our time uh, in FCI helping these countries. And in fact, if you go to almost all countries in the world, FCI has been there sprinkling, you know, the initial seeds. Um, and we're doing this. We have projects in something like 20 countries today. Of course, the, uh, the challenge is the legal infrastructure uh, and, and ensuring that the proper laws and regulations are in, in, intact. And not just, of course, for, for the factoring and receivables finance industry to, to ensure that that receivable can be transferred, can be uh, perfected, can, uh, that, that the rights of those receivables are transferred to that third party. Um, uh, but it's also relating to regulations and it benefits, of course, the credit insurance industry as well. Um, you have two scenarios in receivables. You have the receivables purchase that includes factoring, uh, forfeiting, uh, receivables discounting, and of course, uh, what we see this huge rise in supply chain finance or reverse factoring, payables finance, as some of you call it. Uh, and then the loan products, asset-based lending, which um, you know, right now is predominantly practiced in the U.S., uh, uh, U.K., and uh, also Netherlands, and some other countries. Uh, distributed finance uh, and uh, as well pre-shipment finance, which you were talking about, the pre-shipment purchase order and all. Bain did a study that we've we've used uh, quite quite often, uh, showed quite often, which they estimated that I think by 2023. Uh, over, the, uh, over the past 10 years that there will be a growth in uh, total trade uh, uh, open account accounting for 90% of that, of that figure. So, you know, we did have, uh, I think, to Stefan's uh, comments earlier, the, all these crises, uh, you know, it's, and of course it's been impeded. Uh, we've seen GDP slow, we've seen international trade slow. So, so I don't really know today exactly what that percentage is, but it's probably somewhere between 80 and 90%. Which means, Here's of course, yeah, yeah. In, in the end, uh, trade becomes more and more an open account and finance trade. Yes. And um, 
can you give us an idea about the magnitude also going forward? How much did the receivable supply chain financing grow and what kind of growth rate do you see for the future? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, thank you, Andre. The, the factoring industry today uh, is about 3.5 trillion. If you go back to 2009, it was 1.2 trillion, 1.3 trillion. So, you know, it's grown almost threefold in this period of time. Uh, it's been astronomical. Um, uh, compounded growth rate of 8.2% over the past 20 years. Um, if you compare that to um, other trade products, like for example, letters of credits, letters of credits uh, is about 2.7 trillion. It's been growing at around, you know, flat to a little less. Of course, it's surged and, and supported obviously during this crisis period. Uh, credit insurance has been growing about 5.3%. So it just gives you an idea. Uh, world exports at 2.3%. This is over the past 10 years. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, open account is absolutely the the, the I call it the uh, the green shoots or the uh, the green field of many financial institutions where they don't have receivables products yet. Uh, it is it is the future. Um, in terms of um, you know, why just in the last year, we saw in 2021, a fifth, a fifth close to 14% growth rate in the, in the factoring and receivables finance industry. Um, this year alone, uh, we just reported in June that the uh, in the European Union, it's grown by 22%. So these are figures we, we haven't seen. Uh, I mean, this is kind of unbelievable, but if you go back for the last hundred years, after every crisis, you see, open account receivables products doing extremely well. Uh, and I can give percentages, I won't, I won't bore you with the data, but after the, after the Great Depression in the US, it grew by 14%, after the Great Recession, it grew by 9% uh, compounded. So yes, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very, very good time to be in this, in this sector. Yeah. Peter, this sounds quite impressive. Um, so it is more or less, uh, as I said, uh, going to the 100% of financing of trade. Um, question is, is again to Stefan, what does that mean for the credit insurance industry? Are factoring or reverse factoring uh, competitive or substitute products? Do they work together? And how does the industry um, yeah, basically deal with the fact that there might be an increased concentration of risk on certain buyer groups because of this trend that trade becomes more or less a finance trade? Yes, thank you, Andre. Well, as, as Peter just uh, clearly pointed out, there is a correlation in the growth rate of uh, factoring and, and, and credit insurance. So I would not dare to say that we are um, competing or substituting each other. I would rather arrive at the conclusion that we work nicely together, although our interests are not always 100% aligned. Now, it's not just about the interests of the factoring company and the credit insurer. Let's not forget that there is also a seller in, uh, in the game. And it's always a nice round of negotiation uh, to align the interests of these three parties. Um, now, on the ways we, we, we work together, um, there is a variety of solutions uh, that can be put in place that can go from a simple loss pay clause um, where, where the factoring company is the beneficiary of, 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 of the, the claim payout. That can be, a, let's say, something in the middle between a loss pay clause and being the direct uh, beneficiary of the of the policy as an insured. So the factoring company becomes the insured. There is something in between, um, like a loss pay clause with with some step in rights. But um, yeah, we're all under some um, some kind of regulation regulation regulatory framework. And for the the factoring companies and banks, financing institutions, um, the the capital requirements regulation, the CRR, um, is, is, is very important and they, they want to be as compliant as possible. Now, the thing is that not each and every factoring company has the same interpretation of this CRR rule. So that's always also a nice layer of negotiation that comes in play. But um, all this being said, um, at the end of the, 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 the discussions, um, it's fair to say that not each party has 100% of its interests uh, covered. A seller, he, he, has, he has a commercial relationship with his buyer. So there can always be a hiccup for whatever reason. Um, and the seller can have very good reasons not to claim right away under the insurance policy because that also has consequences on its own. 
The factoring company would like to have a self-liquidating financing mechanism in place. So if the buyer does not pay, then the factoring company would like to turn towards the credit insurer and collect the money there. And the credit insurer, he likes to be on top of the risk exposure and manage the risk himself also. Um, just um, one example, in a, in, in a direct uh, relationship with the seller, a credit insurer would have this protective mechanism like a stop delivery when there is a payment hiccup. Now, that does not work out well if you cover a factoring company directly. So all these interests, and there is room for negotiation. There are some finance and engineering uh, taking place uh, every day. So we have to align our interests. Um, we team up, but at the end of the day, it's like the Rolling Stones saying, eh, not everybody gets satisfaction. So no, there are some, uh, means, some things. It means pushing a little bit for the time. My apologies, Stefan. I understand, yeah. means that coming back to the answer that, uh, that basically uh, cr uh, financing, so trade becoming more and more finance trade is driving also the demand for credit insurance. Of course, uh, interest needs to be light because there's a third party with the bank and the funder. Um, Johnny, do you share Stefan's view on, on this one? Uh, yeah, I think that the, um, the the insurance and invoice financing industries you know, are complementary in many ways. I think you know, just due to the nature of the number of credit insurance policies that are purchased by financiers, then you know, that competition can sometimes be quite minimal altogether. Um, and as Stefan says, there is a there is a spectrum of where the financing entity sits in the insurance relationship. Um, the, the closer they are to the insurer and as being a policyholder, the more control they have over things like the policy wording. Uh, that's not always desirable. I think that for, for many corporates who hold a long-standing relationship with a trade credit insurer, uh, they may want to retain that themselves. Um, they may only be financing a portion of their receivables. And so um, yeah, there's many reasons why that would happen. Um, it is quite a broad topic. Um, and I think that yeah, there's a lot of work has been um, and taken over recent years um, with regards to um, uh, that balance with uh, you know, uh, banks trying to get the regulatory capital relief whilst keeping everyone's interests aligned uh, with, between the clients and the, and the credit insurers. And um, you know, insurers, the insurance market has stepped up to this. You know, there's increasingly dedicated teams within large credit insurers who deal with this sort of business, uh, understand that the policy wording needs to be slightly different and that the way in which this insurance is approached has a slightly different track to you know, your standard corporate insurer relationship. Um, and on the concentration point, I think that you know, uh, syndication absolutely can be a solution. Um, you know, traditionally, the whole turnover in credit insurers uh, haven't always wanted to, to share that risk with their competition. Um, however, over time, this has softened and you know, a more collaborative approach is, is, is certainly happening, um, you know, particularly in the excess of loss market. Um, but there are always some complexities that will be added once you add extra parties to the, uh, to the mix. And so I think you know, it's important to be very clear on what those roles and responsibilities are and to make sure that the wording of the policy reflects exactly what's going on. Thank you, Johnny. Um, Andre, thank you so much for uh, the excellent way in moderating this session. But now I have a question for you. As you are an expert in the area, um, where do you see the relevance of digitalization for the nature of trade? Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, I think in essence, I see two key uh, developments. The first one is that that goods, physical goods, are more and more replaced by services, software. You know, a very classical example, of course. Everybody knows CDs, at least the, the older ones amongst us, and DVDs. They're replaced basically by software, by apps, you know, Spotify. But more importantly, it's the way trade is being conducted, and you can take every element of the, let's say, of the process, the value chain, from the contracting prospecting, invoicing, payment, logistics, financing, collection, everything is more digitalized. And we see in, in line with this trend, more and more platforms uh, coming up also in the B2B space, particularly in the commodities area. Um, can be startups and increasingly it's also more industry giants who are maybe entering this space by, by expanding an existing web shop to a marketplace. Uh, and let's not forget the big techs like Amazon, Alibaba, particularly in SME, they're expanding their B2B SME uh, area. And um, yeah, and uh, the number of clients of SMEs uh, registering on Amazon, for example, is increasing drastically, all driven by the ecosystem logic. And I think it's relevant, very relevant for us that 
it's not only the trade it is basically everything connected to the trade managed via these kind of digital platforms yeah um so the idea is as we everybody as everybody knows from his or her own private experience you go to amazon and everything you need like the transport the insurance the payment the financing is provided by one by one platform basically what does it mean in general uh, greater global reach um that is a little bit countering the effect we see uh, john described so it, it increases globalization platform this increases globalization it makes markets more transparent um, everything is provided by one platform so there is the risk that that uh, some big companies are creating oligopole or monopole even and i think maybe relevant for our industry might be as that data is being collected via these trading platforms and these data is because it's not only about contracting data it's about payment data defaulting data collection data uh there's a lot of data uh, collected on these trading platforms and that can be used also for other purposes yeah um yeah in the end uh there's a lot going on on the digital trade area okay thank you andre in the interest of time um we should more or less start to, to close the session, but if you allow me, I have one more question for you because it seems what we all have seen in the consumer and the business to consumer industries will also happen in the B2B area. Now, what does the trade digitalization as you have just described it mean for the trade credit insurance and finance industry? Yeah, it is maybe not yet really urgent, but it takes also time. I think the expectation everybody has as a private consumer going this platform will be also the expectation towards us in industry so we need to integrate with these kind of platforms and ecosystems and uh, as we, if i'm talking about my employer we have been doing a lot in this space in trying to integrate with platforms like chemics or metals up which is the biggest metal platform of the world uh, connectivity will play a big role so a set of libraries uh, and of rps as i always say uh, rps are the engine of ecosystems so every credit insurer should develop these RPs. Yeah? So in the end, um, all these data collected on these platforms, and Amazon is a good example here, might be used uh, for developing own models, risk models. So there is the threat that maybe one of these big players will try to disrupt our business model. Yeah, yeah as you said, uh, Stefan, we are about to close the session because we have 11 o'clock. Um, I have to say a great thank you also on behalf of our Caesar to all of you. I think it was a great session. Uh, I'm delighted by all your input. And uh, I think we have been able to bring across a couple of areas where the nature of trade is changing. And um, yeah, I think it is an opportunity as always, but there are some stretch, strings attached. And uh, so far the industry is doing very fine in coping with challenge, these challenges going forward. Thank you very much, Andre, and thank you very much to John, Stefan, uh, Johnny, and Peter. I think that was a, a really, really enlightening conversation. I think you covered a, a lot of ground. We had a couple of questions come in, um, but I think I think a lot of those were, were covered. But I think there's plenty of ground for future conversations on this topic. Um, but once again, thank you to everyone, and in particular to Andre for uh, for ch for chairing and moderating this this session. That uh, ends our morning session. Uh, we have actually two more sessions later today, one at uh, 3 p.m. European time. That's on the current trends and evolution in the TCI market. That's looking at a lot of different changes in distribution and um, the way the market is performing and, and operating uh, from now into the future. And that's moderated by Stuart Lawson of Aon Credit Solutions. And then in the evening, for those of you who are uh, totally obsessed with credit insurance on the European side, we've got an update on the uh, the US market, so developments of the US credit insurance market. That should be a really interesting discussion. The the market there is 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 very interesting, um, and hopefully some of you can join us. If you can't, be sure to register so you get updated about when you can view the session again later. Um, but uh, with that, I'll thank you all. Uh, thank you again to our panelists, and hope to see you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.